Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's IEP Live Learn Lunch, which is taking place early today. And because we are joined by, by Maria, fellow of the IEP um, from Bounce Australia. Um, so she didn't have to stay up till midnight. We've brought our session forward. So thank you very much, Maria. It's our 124th in this series. So we're really excited for today. Um, and I'm going to hand you straight across. So, Maria, over to you. All right. Well, good morning everyone and uh it's a good evening over here and we're actually it's been a beautiful day but we've had a lot of rain i'm sure you might have heard there's been so much rain but we're having sun it's been a stunning day tomorrow is going to be 25 but then the rain comes in and then there's lots of flood warnings and things like that um but i love being here and i'm excited to talk about our soft skills trial that we did in 2019 with our department of education skills employment they're now called department of employment workplace relations um, so i just want to speak through a couple of things there and some of the um, strategies you can even implement into the way you're working um, with clients or how you might even look at the service delivery as well so i do want to say um, my husband and i went uh we got to go to london and it was my first time to london about two months ago and um, had a little trip around went to the countryside and only had a few days because we were actually going to a wedding in uh, Belgium. So I had the best time and I seriously, I fell in love with England. So um, I want to go back um, as well. So uh, I appreciate everyone hearing where everyone's from. So there's so much to see and explore as well. So let's get into it and um, talk about uh, a little bit of background around Bounce and who we are. Uh, so for some of you, you might have been on some of the sessions I've delivered uh, over the time working with IEP. Um, and I love being part of IEP. I think they're doing some amazing work. So um, I'm truly honoured that um, they've asked me to jump on and talk today. So we are essentially a, um, we do coaching and training and we've been doing that since 2006. And I suppose the space we really um, stay in, the, 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 um, the wheelhouse that is ours is that soft skills piece around whether it's for um, for the clients, for job seekers or for staff and developing those skills as well. So we, uh, we do a lot of different um, job coach certifications, which you're probably familiar with. IP um, have the licensing rights of that program. So they've got that going and I'm sure you guys have heard about it. If not, you're going to hear about it even more. Um, and then we have our Bounce program, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So let me share with you a couple of ideas around the big picture of what the trial was all about. And um, essentially the, the department wanted to see and take a look at, you know, what's, what's really happening in the context of how people gain confidence and build resilience. And so the curiosity was to look at that, the context of psychological work readiness or how they were sort of framing it, um, but also understand what are the resources that are needed um, and required that would inform um, the future um, tenders that uh, were then put in place um, after that. So I'll give you an idea of how this, this program works. So over here in Australia, um, before the, we've had a new contract launch, but during this time period, this idea of a stream B or C job seeker, um, they are considered the, or a, a stream C would be considered the hardest to place. They would be someone with multiple barriers to employment. They could have generational poverty, generational un unemployment. There could be um, drug and alcohol, language literacy, homelessness, all sorts of barriers that could be in the way. And that places someone in that stream C. Um, and this is how they were sort of working with job seekers back then. Um, and what essentially what this whole um, trial, they wanted to really look and see those changes. So they did do a pre and post uh, survey and we'll be talking about the data and the results with that um, and the psychometric tests that were done as well as what we delivered inside the program. Uh, so, uh, there was a control group and a treatment group, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So part of what we did, so our background, as I said, is in training and development. So back in 2006, I actually designed a soft skills program for the very long term and unemployed, but it was more than soft skills. It was so much about mindset. It was so much about, um, you know, really activating that best self, the idea of what, what's purpose and meaning. Um, finding meaningful employment, but actually driving from values, um, reframing beliefs and like really adjusting that mindset towards the best life. And so the program has been delivered uh, like that here in Australia for 16 years. 
And I, I started the program and then co-designed with participants over the course of about 18 months. And what I mean by that is I had a concept, an idea. The program was always going to be focusing on positive psychology, focusing on um, cognitive behavioral therapy, so that mindset changing, focusing on what outcome they want, um, and really understanding behavioral nudging, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. So what, what that meant is when we actually, we did tender for this and we were successful in running this across Australia. And so the three week program was a non-accredited and, and that means there was no certificates attached, uh, which was important for the cohort because we knew that once you start to introduce, uh, you know, a pen and piece of paper in a training room, for some people it can really have them pull away or shut down or not flourish necessarily. That doesn't mean they don't get there during the course of the program. I always think of bounce as the thing you do before the thing you do. So we knew that we were able to um, really leverage a lot of our trainers that we've trained over the years and trainers who had had eight or nine years delivering bounce um, worked through this, but we did update um, all the trainers in an intensive three day, intensive train the trainer. And um, we also had them understand, they already knew the content they're already delivering because they'd been delivering for quite some time. Um, and just as a distinction, we actually license our program to providers, um, employment service providers, training companies. So that's actually how we run the business. But in this particular um, uh, trial, we were actually doing the delivery of it as well. So part of um, some of those nudges or the behavior change pieces I am going to talk about because I think that's the most interesting piece um, and, and that nudge theory, which is what for us, we can see where the changes and when you see um, the changes for from the metrics, it's really quite powerful. Um, so we also, because we've done this bounce core thing for a while, we, we are known over here as engaging what would be considered disengaging. When I hear that word, I'm like, oh, it's just that it's just the wrong sort of way of saying it, but essentially it's probably the best way is somebody who doesn't know what they don't know. And so perhaps they're in the system and they don't actually understand or have an engagement strategy um, with their consultant, career counselor or coach as well. So let's talk a little bit about soft skills and in the context of this trial and the trial report. And at the end of this, I've got a QR code for you to jump on and grab the actual report. So you can see all the data and all the results that the department released as well. So when we look at that traditional work readiness, um, we can we really do see that a lot of the, the traditional work readiness has the, the, the communication skills and leadership, conflict resolution, time management skills, teamwork skills, all of those elements of what would be considered the, the work readiness. We have those components within the program, but what was really important was what we sort of our foundational elements of bounce is the psychological work readiness indicators. So those the positive attitude, like having that mindset reframe um, and in a, in a way about awareness building. So the emotional intelligence, like bringing self-awareness and social awareness, that self-efficacy, that sense of I can do this and having that coach trainer facilitating the group to lead to that outcome, increasing self-esteem or in some cases self-acceptance, which is even more profound and powerful and resilience and life satisfaction. So these became sort of the key markers. And a lot of the idea here is that internal view of um, how do I get the life I want and creating a container for people to really explore, how do I do that? How do I begin to um, change that? And even before that, we know with the stages of change, there's this, I don't even know that I don't know there's an issue. So we're introducing the conversations in the context of the training room. So it could be the beginning of noticing that, maybe I've got a fixed mindset and perhaps that's what's held me back from going and getting that job I want. So really understanding that idea of um, how do I get the life I want as an empowered thinking, but even before we get there, there's a bit of reframing and that's what we train our trainers to do to really coach and reframe that as well. So we know that the literature is showing there's this really big importance around soft skills and work. We know that, right? We know employers are saying soft skills, soft skills. And we know that there's a, there's a space where somebody coming into work, when they have an awareness, when they have an ability to be um, into, um, it, you know, using intercommunication, understanding what they need to do to change body language or tone or 
um, engage differently. We know that means they're going to engage better in the workplace and the workplace is engaging with them in better ways. So we actually teach that. We, we really unpack that inside the Bounce program as well. So what we can also see is there's that positive link between um, high resilience. When someone has high resilience, they're more likely to be assertive in their job seeking. And um, a lot of the research really points to that sense. And that's why it's that psychological work. If we can build up that sense of self, competency, autonomy, belongingness, if we can build up those core skills and belief, then the, the likelihood of being resilient in their job search. I have a pet cockatoo, by the way, and he's probably going to start squawking because it's that time of night, but it's a cockatoo. Welcome to Australia. Um, and so the other thing is to really understand that there's that scarring effect of unemployment. Um, and so what that does to somebody's well-being, that it really does impact the sense of um, wanting to engage in a better life. Because once they feel that sort of decreased emotion or decreased energy towards well-being, they're just more likely to then go into paths that are just unresourceful. And so, and what we do know with the research is that, you know, somebody who's been long-term unemployed is more likely to have mental illness, is more likely to have physical illness, is more likely to have more visits to the GP, to their doctor, um, and will present um, in emergency in more cases. So this is when we start to realise that if we can think about the well-being, if we can fill up their cup and start to build from that, that even the job over there may be something they can get to eventually, but actually getting that wellness or that well-being is a really critical piece to that. That's not to say that having a job absolutely can increase well-being measures as well. We just want to make sure that people have a, enough competency going into that, like a sense of I've got this versus, um, you know, I'm not feeling like um, I can do this. And so they end up falling out of that job fairly quickly. So some of the scales that we used in um, the trial, the satisfaction to life scale, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, the brief resilience scale, and the career self-efficacy scale. So these, uh, the department had sent those out pre and post. And again, because we had a control group and a treatment group, the control group were just um, randomly selected and they did this, these scales um, pre and post um, and their like it scales. So they were doing that um, with no other interaction. And then the treatment group were then doing it and then going in um, randomly selected to attend a bounce program as well. And all of these scales are validated as well. But I'm going to come back to those scales in just a moment. So a little bit about the design. So where the pre soft skills SMS survey. So this was how the department sent out surveys to all of the job seekers. And then there was an eligibility check um, that meant, you know, if they weren't already um, going into employment, um, if they had medical certificates or they had other activities they were already committed to. So as you can see from this, there's the treatment and the control group. And so the job active is what the employment services model is called or was called. Um, they just had servicing as usual um, versus the treatment group came and worked with Bounce doing the behavioural um, uh, insights um, interventions as well and then they did the post trial survey and then those soft skills outcomes were measured so that's how the department collected their data and now I'm going to speak to some of that data because it's really quite um, interesting to look at the changes so when we actually have this consideration so this is after attending the trainer uh, the training so there were fewer participants that reported dissatisfaction and more reported higher levels of satisfaction. So we know that we increase that level of life satisfaction. So just as a, as a consideration, if somebody starts to feel that sense of life's okay, they're just more likely to engage in different ways with their coaches or with whoever's you know, in their, their service delivery model or with an employer well, or even then in the community and other levels of engagement. So understanding that increased dissatisfaction to life um, is an important element to starting to then look at flourishing and looking at, well, what is possible? What could I do differently? How might I begin? And a lot of those, um, in our job coach certification, we do a lot of the, the strategies around questions and quality of questions. That's the opportunity to start framing towards what could you do? How could life work for you? Um, I was coaching a client recently and um, it was a really interesting moment of, you know, as they were not fit for the first session I had, they were not happy, things weren't great. 
And uh, what when I asked the question, what do you want? They actually were like, I don't know, but this isn't great. Things aren't good. They went to everything that wasn't working. So I gave them some strategies, positive psychology strategies, like in the bounce program. And then when I caught up with her a month later, she'd been implementing these strategies and she was vibrant and energized. There was a higher satisfaction to life. When I asked her about what was next, she actually was happy with where things were at and she was more willing to engage intrinsically, internally into taking action towards where she wanted to go. So when we start to realize if we can just get that satisfaction to life um, increased, and that's that's what we do inside the bounce program to get that to get that increase as well as well. It just means somebody's more likely to start to look at things differently, which is also the same with the self-esteem scale. So incredibly, this was a huge increase of 170% increase to their um, high self-esteem. Um, it's a massive increase, and it's probably for me um, one of the, the the best distinctions of what's possible. Once you start increasing that self-esteem, now we've got some intrinsic um, that self-efficacy. It's like actually, I can do this, and I can go forward, and I can think differently. You know, I can set a goal, and I can live by my values. So we now start framing their experience and how they may engage intrinsically. This is an important element to how people can own their change is finding an intrinsic desire to do that. So now we're actually coming from a cup that's overflowing, their self-esteem is higher, suddenly they start to see perspectives really differently and therefore are more likely to make different choices. So I think this is a big one. Um, you know, some of the strategies in terms of how we how we achieve this is through, you know, even the consideration of things like um, what's important to them and their values. And um, we do a whole piece around integrity. So it's that sense of, you know, being their word, but also understanding their autonomy. What are they in control of and what can they do? Because once they get a sense that the one thing they're doing achieves more, um, they can then build on that. So we actually start really small and really simply. And um, I'm going to share some of the nudges later with how we specifically can increase that self-esteem. So we know with the brief resilience scale, um, we could see that there was a smaller portion of participants reported the low um, resilience with a larger portion reporting a higher resilience. So we know that increased as well. And again, when we think about resilience um, and, you know, through the, through the pandemic, a lot of people really got tested on that resilience. Um, when we think about VUCA, the VUCA, um, the volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity of a, a VUCA world, meaning there's so much going on um, that most people um, in that context really began to, you know, de-energize or overuse resilience and so exhaustion set in. Um, people were feeling, you know, underwhelmed or overwhelmed. Um, but when we think about this ability to build the muscle of resilience, it's really crucial to the ongoing piece, that forward mapping in how I'm going to engage in my life as a skill. And so building resilience, one of those core elements to any human. Um, and interestingly enough, when we think about like strengths profiling, we know when someone has um, through the pandemic with the um, strengths profiler tool, what they found globally is people who had a natural resilient strength um, actually went over to a learned behavior because they overused it. And so as a distinction here, it's interesting to see where people can learn the skill. So this was 2019. Um, and so they can learn that skill. And I'd be so curious to know if there was any tools or resources for those participants. We, we didn't interact with the participants um, from the point of view of privacy. Um, but I would be really curious to know where are they sitting now? Or how did they manage the pandemic? Because I think that'd be really interesting to see if they develop resilient skills to do that as well. So let's talk about this uh, career self-efficacy. So this is an interesting one. So although there was reporting higher um, career self-efficacy, the challenge with this actual um, scale is that it's actually reported as if you're in a job. And so with a lot of the participants who didn't, they weren't working when they were actually questioning that they weren't able to sort of weight it against a job to sort of go, well, do I feel good in my job? Um, so it's one of those tools that probably or scales that probably wasn't um, as resourceful because it just had, um, it was statistically um, significant, not enough of a difference to really um, say, wow, that was amazing between the two groups. And I think that's relating to that. 
So just on that, the, the point of the um, career outcomes. So during the, sorry, before the pandemic, so 2019, as participants were going through this program, so it was delivered across the Eastern Seaboard of Australia. So Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, um, mostly in the metropolitan areas, but in some regional communities it was delivered. And what they found in the metro areas that one in four went into employment. And so again, these are the stream C's um, and they went into employment. And they at, during that time when they were like checking the data, um, they they thought the department was like, hang on, we've got to check that. That doesn't, that's not possible. So they kept going, check, kept checking, and sure enough, it's what what had occurred. But then the pandemic hit. And so unfortunately, um, I uh, unfortunately because of the pandemic, all those jobs were gone. Um, so that data does not appear in the report because it's it's uh, it it just doesn't it doesn't hold up over the time period that the department would require. So a twenty six week outcome to fifty two week. So a, a lot of those elements were not reported on um, simply because of randomness of a of the pandemic that kicked in. Um, so those people that were working um, were not working after that. So we were really quite excited and very hopeful for that. So it'd be great to, you know, do another broader trial as well to just to really test some of these things. Um, and I actually think one thing that would be really interesting is if you were actually doing skills development or coaching skills in the, in the space as well. So with the providers um, to start to really consider, um, you know, the things they could do differently in their interactions as well. So let me talk a, a little bit about the um, participants' experience uh, and some of the, the experience of, you know, the improved soft skills of confidence. Um, we, uh, their rating of motivation uh, and resilience, that all increased. So we actually had our own data collection as well. And um, one of the elements that was clear was that sense of um, intrinsic motivation and willingness to move forward which was a great outcome. And again, they build their autonomy to go and make a difference in their life because they can or they feel empowered to or they're just filling up their cup more or they are living their best life. And then with the relationship of that provider or that job coach, we're now actually talking about a really powerful combination, somebody to keep the momentum going as well. So the areas that the job seekers really loved, one of those was um, anchoring and what that means, not in the context of, um, in the context of behavioral economics, um, but more in the concept of understanding condition responses. So understanding how we can um, have a, a relationship to something and then a conditioned response like Pavlov's dog um, and then our reframing technique. So this was a big one in terms of getting them to what we call flip a belief where they might think something's unresourceful. So the trainer's skills as a coach is fundamentally the key that makes this all work. Um, our content uh, is, is you know, quite an interesting space, but there's not anything in there that you go, oh, wow, that's great, we should do that. It's pretty much what's standard out there. It's the approach of our trainer's training that would I would say that's the secret sauce here, is their ability to facilitate um, in a masterful way, facilitate towards the outcome and the conversation and to um, using behavioural um, economics insights to actually engage their thinking towards that outcome as well. And so the other element is our social proof. Um, and so what I mean by that is having a group come together, there is that sense of um, influence. So we know with social norms in behavioural economic insights, social norms are that if somebody's doing it, I'll do it. And that does influence that group work. So that's why when you're bringing people together, it's really important that you've got a skilled facilitator or trainer who's able to move towards that outcome um, for people to work towards that best life versus a trainer who may make a flippant remark or shut down someone in a group setting, which makes people feel ashamed or disconnected, a skillful way of engaging people and, um, and you know, deeping, deepening that sense of respect and really developing a sense of hope because that hope is going to bring in that, um, that self-acceptance, self-esteem as well. So one of the elements that we really, uh, we really love to sort of leverage is this idea of agreement making. And this is one of our, our nudges that we use. Um, and 
um, part of that is they make little agreements, just the simplest little things that they can agree to um, that will make the difference in how they begin to feel. It may be as I'll drink more water. And I'll give you an example. Years ago, I had a young guy in one of my programs and he was he drank three litres of Coke a day and he was um, he was certainly overweight. He might have even been near the obese side because he was just so unwell um, and he didn't exercise and he spent a lot of time gaming. And he came to the Bounce program and his agreement was to drink more water. In fact, he said, I'll, drop, I'll stop drinking Coke and I'll drink water. And I said, well, let's set you up for success. Let's transition off the Coke, maybe to you know, some seltzer flavoured water and then over to water. So over the course of two weeks, he actually did that. And then what naturally happened, so that's a little nudge, right? A little nudge that had him do one behavior change. Then what happened is he started walking to class. And so those last four weeks, the weight just dropped off him because he started to walk, not drinking Coke. And he was actually really genuinely energized about life. So he started to increase that sense of hope and optimism and go, actually, what could I do? What is next? Versus when he came in, you know, he was probably thinking, well, there's nothing for me and, and life's too hard. So that's a little example of, of a nudge, but it's also a social proof piece because other people are making little agreements and they can be as small as I'll drink more water to as large as I'm going to apply for that job. I'm going to cold call this place or uh, I'm going to go home and clean my kitchen, um, that kitchen drawer that's full of stuff and I've got to go do it. So it's the little things that make the big difference that we build on. Remembering we want to, we want to have the behavior change feel elegant um, and it's behaviorally intrinsic to them to want to do it. And we've got a nudge towards that because part of that uh, understanding is we've got this negativity bias and that negativity bias is what's likely to go, I can't do this. This is too hard. Nobody will hire me. So we as, as trainers have to keep focusing on, well, what can you do? And I get it, that's hard. So what could you do if you had success the way you want it? Or what could you do if you were drinking more water daily? Um, so that's a that's a big part of it. But I'll I'll share some more insights as well. And I just wanted to share some of the feedback. Um, and I love, you know, that consistent language around, you know, the confidence and um, feeling good about themselves, self self worth as well. So within the program, we do the the job readiness elements. So we do actually do elements of cover letters. And um, in this context, we did, the, the department actually wanted that to be built in, um, which we have always done that. So those, um, those skills that are necessary for getting the job, but we also really lean into the um, employer bill, um, sorry, that it being ready for those interviews. And we set them up for that understanding of what do they need to do in order to be ready for the employment opportunities. And this links back to that agreement making because we know they've got to have a frame around being willing to work. We've got to have a frame around what does being on time mean um, and what their agreement is with their employer and finding a way for them to intrinsically go, oh, actually getting to work, you know, 10, 20 minutes earlier is actually a really great thing. I get, it gets my mindset ready and I'm off and running versus, you know, showing up late, which we know employers um, see that as a pattern and they may see that as, um, somebody who's not employable. So we really unpack a lot of that. We do an employment preference summary. There's a whole piece of like going through and defining. But one of the things I want to make really clear, we really values explore inside Bounce. So we don't even talk about goal setting until near the end of the program. We actually explore what's important to you because we know that's what drives behavior is really understanding um, the drive of importance to the value. And that's what will actually increase the likelihood of them saying, I'm getting more confidence and self-esteem because they know themselves more. And that's where that emotional intelligence piece comes in as well. So uh, the, again, it's the trainer piece. Um, the, the trainers are the key here. And so whatever you, you guys would know this, you would see um, programs you run, it does come down to who that, it, it, who that trainer is. Um, and we see that as part of our role when we train trainers and do licensing. We want the trainers to actually be skilled in the coaching, um, you know, understanding all the things, the elements of facilitating dynamic groups and how to facilitate the group change as well in the best possible way. Um, so one of the things that um, the department came to visit um, a day one and a day two. Day one's crucial for our setup and our trainers get, a, you know, a whole strategy around how to set up a day one so that we have 
you know, higher completion rates. Like they're things that we know if we're getting them in the room, staying in the room, that's a great thing unless they go to employment, which is always awesome. Um, I can't tell you how many stories of people that start a bounce program, get a job and then go, oh, can I start my job when I finish bounce? And I love that because, you know, they want to keep working on themselves. And honestly, when do we get time to spend a day thinking about values and a day thinking about resourceful beliefs and a day mapping out your future? When do we have the luxury of that time? Um, and that's one of the frames we talk about. Like this is this program's for you. They go in, it's for them and really designing and defining their life and where they're going. Um, but we want to start with filling up their cup. So the department had a visit and they came in to a day one and two. And um, the gentleman who was heading up this project, who's been in the um, industry for quite some time, he was floored at the engagement of the room and the facilitation of that trainer from what was day one, which was quite like, oh, I've got to do this program. Oh, I've got to be here. Um, and that disengagement. And he couldn't believe the day two from as the end of day one to the day two coming in and people are energized and engaged. And I explained to him, that's the trainer facilitation. That's what we do to get them to be able to consistently have that, that facilitation to engage the room and keep them in the room. Um, so we're aligning to what their needs are and their values. Again, very high on autonomy. They choose to be in the room because we know if they're put in the room, otherwise they lose a payment or something. Um, we know that's not intrinsic. So we have to reframe quickly to have it be something they want to do or something they, they, uh, they choose to do as well. So uh, some of the things that, um, and you'll see if you, you download the report, and again, I'll have the, you'll see the QR code at the end of these slides. And I can definitely, I think Kelly um, is gonna organize. Oh, great. She's added the, the link in there already for the, for the trial report. You can have a look and I'm happy to do the PDFs for this, these slides as well. Um, so the department deemed the trial a successful um, program um, and they could see clearly the increase to self-esteem resilience and life satisfaction. So for them, that's what they wanted to see to look at what happens if we increase these things, what, what happens next? Now, all the research would point to, again, that more likely to engage in their own job search, more likely to find work, stay in work um, and just be happier. You know, it, it, there's something about that, like, wouldn't it be great to just have people feel good and be happier? Um, so ideally that's happening and then people are finding work or volunteering that's meaningful as well. Um, and I think that's an important um, element to how we look at um, supporting people into the future as well. And um, what, what we really considered that idea of the, the part where Bounce has been sitting in for us, we run the program, we're, we're running programs in prisons, um, we're running in New Zealand with a, a beautiful social enterprise that have, uh, they work specifically with young Māori kids that are youth that are 12 to 24, 12, can you believe it, that are 12 to 24, they're quite disengaged or they've been in, um, they've had some time in juvie, um, they've been in a gang, they've lost their way and they, in, they integrate the bounce soft skills and I train their trainers and their trainers are all young. Um, so I'm actually heading over in a couple of weeks to train a, a team of new trainers and they're all like 17, 18, 21, 23, and they are so energized and just doing some beautiful work. Um, uh, Bounce has been in the US running in Massachusetts in different providers over there. And we work in the career centers there. We work in little community groups. Um, we're working with Volunteers of America who have the Returning Citizens Program as well and community colleges. So they put it into the context that makes sense for them. And that's where it's, it's really that building that resilience, the confidence in all of those skills for that person to then move into the what's next for them. So um, some of the elements of the learning. So, um, you know, the improving the aspects of psychological work readiness is linked with motivation to apply for jobs and talk to employers and increase confidence at job interviews. So that was probably for the, the department, a big thing to see, can we get that intrinsic motivation or autonomy for somebody to go, I'm going to take on this. I'm going to take charge of my own uh, journey as well. And, um, and I think that can also help in terms of when we actually need to support those that really have multiple barriers that we need to lean in and really give our time and energy and resources to. If we can have people set up for success that can have more of that independence or autonomy, then it does mean we can put our re resources into the, the needs of those that really do need it. 
Um, so any training that's going to really enhance well-being and living standards, that's how I would view anything that you're delivering. Um, what is it that you can do to in increase well-being and increase that sense of, you know, hope, intrinsic motivation, or that self-determination, the willingness to, to, to desire for something more, to live best life. Remembering that, it could be a very steep gradient to even think about that. So we, we start the journey of a bounce program and it's very connected and it's slow moving. We're not talking about what's next. We're talking about what's here and, and going for what's good. So things like gratitude, the simplest thing of what is good in life right now. You know, what's, um, what's good? Well, I can be here in this class with this, this group. Um, it could be the simplest little thing that I have some food that I can drink this water and finding the good things to then build on. And we know with any type of gratitude work, um, it's been well researched that it can really build that sense of hope to go into that next step of what somebody might like to do. So um, let's have a look at, um, this is again for employment services in, in Australia, but understanding that when we are thinking about how can we incorporate more of the psychological well-being, including resilience, self-efficacy and confidence, like how are you doing that when you think about your service delivery and what ways you could be considering those key well-being indicators, whether you do the pre and post yourself with, with some of your clients, um, but understanding that the staff element's really important here. And when we consider you know, the consultant or the coach or whoever's working with the clients, their ability to um, be highly positively engaged. But here's the trick. Um, because we know we've got the part of the brain that's quite, um, it's, you know, it's just system one of the brain is lazy by default, right? So what that means is it's going to conserve energy. And so when it talks about taking action, it's kind of like, oh, if it's easy, I'll do it. And this is a big piece to understand when you're talking about implementing anything, it must be easy and convenient, keep it simple. And if it's too complicated or too hard, people disengage and we do this. Every human does this, right? If you think about your phone right now and signing up to something and when it auto fills your information, if you guys have got that set on your phone and it auto fills your information, that's easy and convenient and you're more likely to go keep going. Or you think about shopping online, if some of you shop online and where it auto fills your credit card, you're more likely to go boom. Um, so it's, you know what I mean? It's just, it's all easy and convenient. Is this something that um, I'm gonna find easy? So thinking about that, when you think about the people that are coming in, what are you doing to make it easy for them so we can override that system one that's too hard, too complicated, I'm not doing it. So one of our strategies in Bounce is that when people come into the room, we don't have workbooks and pens out because the chances are maybe they had an experience in their, in school that wasn't so great. So we, we don't want to trigger that moment of going, oh, this is like school. Um, so we want them to come in and feel um, comfortable. We want them to feel belonging. This is the highest value that we drive as human behavior in human beings is our, our belongingness. And so if we can understand that they come into the room and the trainer can really engage in that sense of belonging uh, to, for the group, the belonging in the group, not just for the trainer, we've got specific strategies we do for the, the group to really form together. Um, part of that will have them feel that sense of um, connection and trust and they've got each other's back. And that's what's really important to think about if you're doing any group work is that real sense of um, belonging being part of that. And so that could mean how you pull your groups together or how you're selecting people um, might make a difference. When we did the trial, we didn't have that luxury. It was all just, um, they were just selected in um, randomly to go into, the, into the, the program as well. So ease and convenience means that whatever they're doing, they, it's gonna be easy for them. Um, social norms means that people, the social proof, like what other people are doing as a positive way, I could do that. Um, that's a really big one, but the, your, your, um, your coaches, anyone working in the context of training, it's really important that they have a high value of self-care. And I'll tell you why. If they are resilient in themselves and they can take care of themselves and they have a real ritual around that, when they come into the room 
to engage, they're going to be more consciously aware. They're more active in system two, which is that prefrontal cortex. That's the one that's paying attention. That's the one that's noticing, oh, let me, let me go over here and check if this person's okay. So they've just got an increased emotional intelligence. Um, and that's probably something as a strength. If you're thinking about having a trainer, um, doing some work, these are the things you want to be looking for, that they've got a really high level of self-awareness and social awareness. They've got an ability to be flexible in their communication. Um, they've got a growth mindset. If they have that fixed mindset as a trainer, they're likely to look at what's not working. You want the growth mindset and they're going to consistently look at what's possible. What can I do? What can I achieve? Um, and that also means that they're more likely to not take on and have, you don't want high empathy because if they take on the journey of every client they're working with, um, they can get quite exhausted. So there has to be a level of empathy there, but to the point where it's they, they are emotionally crying, it's probably um, they're not a fit for delivering you know, training programs um, only because they've got to take care of themselves more. Um, and you know, part of a lot of our trainers are very high care. They love people and they are high empathy, but they are vigilant about how they care about themselves. Um, and that's, that's a big piece is their strategies for doing that. Remembering that they're also role modeling that as well. So I'll just click over to this next because I might answer some questions in chat. That's the, the trial report. Kelly has popped it into the link. It might be easier. Um, that goes to our website if you want to see more information about um, uh, us and what we do. Uh, and certainly um, if anyone's interested in, you know, how we do our license train the trainer um, and how we specifically run that, happy to chat and connect. Um, but certainly there's a lot inside the report that you can take in and sort of figure out your own strategies and what you might want to do also. So what I might do is I'll put, I don't know if you can hear my cock too, but he's having a great time because my voice is really loud and he's like, oh, let me talk while you're talking. Um, so I do apologize if it's very loud. Uh, so what I might do is stop sharing my screen because I actually can't see you guys because when I put this up, it sort of takes over. Oh, there's everyone. Hello. Okay. So, so um so yeah, I the, the cocktail, yeah, the cocktail's not too loud because he's not set off my dogs yet. So we would know if he was being too loud. Because okay. the dog well, would be like, oh what's that? Yeah. So uh, yes. Yep. No, that that's great, Helen. If I had my AirPods out, perhaps you would suddenly be um be hearing him. So uh now do you want me to quickly go through questions or do you want to point me in the right direction, Helen? Yep, I've got some for you. So I've made a note. Great. So the first question we had was from Tony and she says, I work with a lot of neurodiverse participants. How could I adapt to their needs? And she's big question. I know. Yeah, that's huge. So um, I actually delivered a, a session for a group and I had someone reach out about this and I did find some articles. So if you want to send me an email, I'll send you some of those articles as well. But in the context, so again, I think what the trainer skill is to go, who's my audience? Who is in the room here? And their adaptability is critical here. So they must be able to say, like, this is not cookie cutter. This is not one size fits all. It's about understanding who is my audience um, and do they have a skill in that space as well um, or a background that might help them facilitate that? But understanding what does it take to sort of minimise distraction, keep it really calm. So it may be that the group has no, you know, um, vibrant energy going on in the group. There's no personalities that might set something off. Um, things are really calm, relaxed, ordered, controlled and simple and easy. And I think they're little elements to consider um, how you might do group facilitation. And that might help in the context of their norming, uh, sorry, their yeah, those social norms, like that social proof, like feeling a belonging to go, oh, I'm okay. So I would, I would certainly look at a cohort-based training of people that have a similar need so that you can actually facilitate in a better way and a facilitator who has a skill to sort of manage that. So they don't opt to their style. They actually can say, actually, I need to be really clear and audit audit auditory or give my delivery simply, clearly and strategically or written out and notice the difference. Is it a video or is it here's a handout to read and, and change it up like that? I hope that helps. Excellent. Thank you. It's really interesting. Um, and I know that Kelly has popped um, Maria's email address in for anyone who wants to send across for those articles mentioned. Paul asked, 
Anything established re-job outcomes? Uh, anything established from the trial about the job outcomes? Yeah, so... Uh, I believe so, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was where they didn't put it in the report because of COVID. <laughs> we were heartbroken, let me, let me say. Um, so what I can say... Um, and I'll speak to a few different elements. So where we have partners delivering the, the program, the employment outcome rate, so we do like to get that data from our partners. So a, a pretty significant one is in uh, Massachusetts with Worcester Career Centre. They have a 84% uh, employment outcome rate of using the BOUNCE program. Now they use it this way. They engage deeply with employers. They do five days of BOUNCE soft skills. They then do a five day certificate that is connected to a job placement. And so it's very strategic, it's very engaged. They have workforce investment boards. So they've got employers around the table saying, here's our needs. Well, and so they design, it's co design. That's the secret co design. Um, so, so part of that is then that's where they're getting those achievements. So when we were running the program prior to going into an accredited program, so uh, I think when I delivered the program, it's 84% outcome, employment outcome. My background was in recruitment. So it was a natural thing to go and find people jobs and work with them to do that. Um, but it was actually easy to get them to be self-empowered to go and get those jobs. Um, so currently we have a partnership with the Jesuit Community College here in, in Melbourne, in Victoria. They've been a partner with us for 10 years. Uh, and I know their completion rate, so their model is funded by education funding and their completion rate sits at 72% completion. The TAFE Community College rate is at 13% of the same type of um, accredited program, not bouncified. So that's a good distinction of engagement as well. But in terms of employment data from the department from this trial, the one in four was what we were given, but it wasn't put in the report. Okay, that's wonderful. Interesting. Thank you. So Jeanette has asked, has the program been quantified within a social return on investment framework? Oh, no, but wow, it needs to be. <laughs> I need to copy and paste that. Is that in here? It is in there. Yeah, I can share that afterwards. I have all the chat. I know Jeanette comes to a lot of our sessions and she always has fantastic questions. So, uh, Oh, my gosh, yeah. Jeanette. There you go. It's no, not many that's people. Really, that's really, yeah, sorry. It, well, it's not many people that ask you a question that you can't immediately respond to. So uh, I'm giving props well, there it, to Jeanette. It, it, uh, it's a great question and no, it hasn't been done. So that is, I, um, so I am talking with our a different department, um, our prime minister and cabinet area about this trial report because they're really interested in looking at, you know, other areas and other spaces. So we've actually been in discussion. So I am definitely going to be talking about that. Um, Jeanette, I love that question. Excellent. I'm so copying Antoinette it now. Asked, um, I may, she says she may have missed this, but were the trainers that you mentioned earlier psychologists or from this type of background? So no, like a lot of uh, some had some had counselling degrees. Uh, some were def, like definitely coaches. They had a coaching qualification. Uh, in fact, you know some of our best trainers. Uh, came from you know the school of life and were able to really relate deeply um, and facilitate that change but all of them had a passion for um, understanding these models or they came in with that background so diploma of positive psychology um, I certainly would say um, if you have somebody with a diploma of po positive or masters of um, applied positive psychology definitely someone who would have the capacity to at least understand the science um, but there's a very in interesting skill set in delivering training to a group. And that's, that's, um, that is different to having the degree in psychology. And I think that's a big distinction of, you know, how I do that. I certainly think, as I said earlier, like depending on your cohorts, it really does come down to that qualification as, a, as an advantage. But then that ability to facilitate is is the key distinction and i think that shows up in all of our feedback on trainers and um and how the report worked with in terms of the trainers like that was a key distinction the department really got that because when they went to visit they could see that impact of those trainers engaging deeply with participants as well 
Excellent, thank you. Um, now, the next question we had um, was someone needed to leave um, because they have a coaching session at uh, 10 30. So they'd asked if we were going to make the recording available, which so uh, it's a good question for me to answer to everyone, which is yes, absolutely, we are. Um, it will be available hopefully later today because it's nice and early in the morning. So it gives me time. I suspect we'll be doing it via the IEP Vimeo channel rather than the YouTube channel, which is where historically we've done it. But we will mail out to everyone who's attended when we have that ready now i know we were also asked about slides so um i have mentioned maybe we could get the pdfs in kelly said that's fine because people love just slides and wanted to refer to them so once i've got all that together i'll send everyone the links that you need in those pdfs you've already got the link to the report so that's fantastic um, Kelly's also popped in there around any queries on the programs, please reach out. Kelly's email is in there, which is kelly at bounceglobal.net. Maria's email is, and this is for the recording, obviously, maria at bounceglobal.net. Um, and I've also popped a link earlier on in the chat for those who are on around the coaching for employability and the Pearls system programs that are available via the IEP. You can access it through our website. So for those of you who would like to, you can either email myself or you can access that link um, and we'll share that information because it's a fantastic program. I'm sure all of you who have um, been with us for the past 55 minutes will see um, how great the content is. Um, based upon what we've seen today, you'll know um, it's it's a great um, content there. Now, I was trying to give people some time there. I have said, if you want to pop your hands up, if anyone's got a question, but you don't want yeah. to type, because I, some people go, oh, I, I want to ask this question, but I don't want to type it. If anyone wants to pop their hands up before we finish the session and ask Maria a question, um, now's your opportunity. I think they're being quite shy, Maria. I know. Oh, um, the, oh, we've got them. Thank you so much. Tony says, thank you so much, Maria and Helen and all. I have a progress review meeting now with my participant. Brilliant session. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, Karen says, apologies, another meeting, but a brilliant oh. session. Okay, I've got a question to ask, if possible. Hi, Claire. Um, I, I just wondered, um, have you got a, a bounce programme in this country, in England? No, not yet. Right, because I I'd love to go on it, but um, yeah. I know. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So we um, look. We we have every intention. Um, before COVID, we had every intention. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely something we'd love to be able to do to have a partner in there wanting to do the bounce program. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, with the train the trainer, it isn't a set and forget. And I've got a. a this is like my biggest piece to this. The trainers are on a journey. And so we, we maintain their professional development. So anything we learn that's new, the skills development, um, we go on a journey with them. So they're not just sort of go do train the trainer and see you later. We actually continue to develop them. So trainers that have been with the Jesuits or over in the US, they just keep getting upskilled with us. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the partner loves it because we're, we're enhancing their skills that they use in other ways, not necessarily just using bounce. Um, so definitely would love to find a partner in the UK. Any I'm, sure we can, I'm sure we can facilitate that Maria I've already got some ideas but I'll pick that up with you later Yay. and but in yes. the meantime we do have the coaching for employability in the Pearl system that is available that is um, Maria and the bounce teams work so there is an introduction to some of the concepts and themes there available straight definitely, away definitely yeah. yeah and and that that's probably the big piece that the coach so again the coaching skills within that are actually a really deep broadened um coaching skill to to sort of how do i speak to this participant or frame it how do i reset how do i set myself up so i'm actually finding the best in my my people um and part of that is using you know the quality of the questions it's how they frame it or reframe it it's how they're listening it's the positive emotion. It's the impact of how am I being or who am I being um, as well. So the, the, the coaching skills are, are really, there's something I'm really passionate about. And I did that before, developed that program before COVID. And then we were able to adapt to an online program. And it's been a really exciting and well-received um, with amazing feedback. So definitely um, IAP have got everything like that um, over there. So have a look. Um, and the Pearl system's a really simple, easy approach to sort of setting up appointments. We've had probably the most feedback on Pearls, actually, because it's simple, easy, and, and you can put it in place straight away. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Claire. Um, so a different Claire has said, um, as 
popped a message in there for you, Maria, saying um, this session has been so insightful, lots of food for thought. Thank you. Sheila, whose name I can pronounce properly now. Um, so sorry, I need to leave, but thank you. Jeanette has said thank you. Happy to talk more about the social return on investment work that we yes. are doing here. And she shared her email and I'll make sure that you have that um, or we won't thank finish you. the Will session you? until you've got oh, yeah. that. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I think everybody's probably asked the questions they're going to ask right now. And I'm just aware of the time. We're exactly on time. So I'm going to say a massive, massive thank you to Maria and to um, to Kelly for getting this set up and for working in your evenings to come and visit with us again. It's always no a pleasure. I've been sharing some of this with my IEP team while we've been running the session because I've not been able to wait to share some of it. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you to all of you who are have taken time out of a different time of your day for us it's always great to see so many people on here don't forget you can log this as cpd um, with your iep if you're an iep member so please make sure you do we're always committed to that um, and if you do have any further questions that you think of afterwards just let me know and i will get that to maria and i know she'll be keen to hear those questions and thoughts and and respond to them so thank you all everyone enjoy your wednesday whatever it is that you are doing um, and I'll see you all very soon. I'm going to stop the recording yeah. now. Thanks, Maria. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Helen. Thank you very much. Thank you.